The mules are in the corral. Welcome to Mule Talk, and I'm Cindy K. Roberts, your host. On this episode of Mule Talk, we have back our author, TV personality, and world-renowned mule trainer, Meredith Hodges of the Lucky Three Ranch. Welcome back. We covered a lot of good info on the last episode about breeding, and of course, you have more to share with us. This will be part two of that episode on breeding. Go ahead. Okay. Like I said in the first episode, I had a lot of breeding experience on my mother's Windy Valley Ranch in Healdsburg, California. We had some really nice jacks. And even we had seven genets that we bred to to get more jacks. But we also had a herd of 60 head of broodmares that were from a variety of breeds of horses. And we tried to get the best horses we could find. Because in the past, the uh, horses that were unsuitable for improved horse breeding programs were the mares that were used for mule breeding. And that's where you see those old muley looking mules. <laughs> looks and confirmation were of little concern since the animal that was produced had limited use for draft and farm work. In 1967, with the founding of the American Donkey and Mule Society, a new type of mule began to emerge, the American saddle mule, limited only by the imagination in his uses. As the mule's popularity grew, so did the need for more carefully organized breeding programs to try to produce only the most superior mules in overall appearance and athletic ability. And this is what we were trying to do out at Windy Valley Ranch. In phase one of the Lucky Three Ranch Breeding Program, my mother, Joyce Doty, successfully bred an attractive, athletic, and versatile mules at Windy Valley Mule Ranch in Healdsburg between 1973 and 1979. They were bred for pleasure, work, and show from 60 head of assorted breeds of mares. These mares included Arabians, thoroughbreds, Tennessee walkers, Morgans, and draft horses, but no warm bloods. We learned that jacks would produce a stronger and more durable offspring, but that the heavy bone mammoth jacks were not necessarily producing the most athletic or the most attractive saddle mule offspring. It seemed that the smaller, more refined, large standard and standard jacks were better for the production of saddle mules. This led to phase two of our breeding program. Little Jack Horner, he was a large standard jack and was the last jack born at Windy Valley Ranch before its dispersal in 1979. In 1980, I brought him to the Lucky Three Ranch in Colorado, sized down the program, and breeding my own mules with Little Jack Horner. His half-brother, Lucky Three Sundowner, I brought here too, and I began showing him while Little Jack Horner was growing. And uh, Little Jack Horner was used uh, with different breeds of mares, including quarter horses, Appaloosas, half Arab, half quarter crossbreds, and paints, and Arabians. And all of these mules that I bred with him and these mares were outstanding. performers, I have to say. Now, I might mention at this point that when you're looking to breed the mares, you're not just breeding to different mares. you got to make sure that you're breeding to the ideal examples, would you say, of their breed. Okay. So their confirmation, their confirmation has to be impeccable. Mm-hmm. And so, so you do. You look at the 45-degree angles on the hips. You look for pretty heads. You look for legs that have proper action through the hocks, the fetlocks, the knees. So they've got good action in their movement and all the things that they need to excel in athleticism. You know, for anything that you might want to do. You know, a lot of these uh, all-around horses, like Appaloosas, Quarter Horses, and Paints, can do a number of things. They, they are good Jim Canna animals. They're great show animals in English and Western pleasure. They do Western riding, reining, all of these really fun things that people like to do most often. And then in the English world, English pleasure, hunter hack, jumping, and all of these kinds of things, they're finding that these mules can do all these things that horses do. And that was what I, I tried to breed for in the very beginning. I wanted mules to have a whole new repertoire of things to do, not just farming and draft work. I needed to show people that mules were good for anything horses could do and then some. And the end then some gets really, really interesting. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it does, because 
my mules showed against horses, and after sufficient training and showing, they began to win at everything they did. All the Jim Canna events, all the English Western pleasure, reigning Western riding, ranch riding, trail, all the things you could do, and including even driving. And, and you're um, talking about and, against horses? Against horses. <laughs> That's when you, they started throwing you out of places. They asked you not to yeah. come back. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. They, they, well, and, and one of the first mules that ever did that was Hambone from Fort Carson. <laughs> and he went up against the Olympic uh, jumping horses and beat them and got himself thrown out the first time. And uh, <laughs> so that was... That was kind of the, the, the thing that happened to mules, you know. <laughs> yeah. And, well, yeah, and people got the idea that that's the way it is, and they didn't get that they didn't get it that the mules were superior <laughs> because the people that threw them out made excuses right, that weren't right. so pretty. <laughs> you know, oh, they scared my horse. Oh, they <laughs> raced so loud and they scare everything on the place. Okay. They can't do it anyway, and they're really ugly and. <laughs> You know, there's just a number of things that that they would throw out there. So I did kind of take a different approach. At first, I said, well, my mule is half horse. So your rules say that horses can compete. So my mule should be able to. But that's kind of a snotty attitude. And, and <laughs> mules and donkeys don't really come along with a snotty attitude very well. In fact, you use it on them and they will humiliate you <laughs> and teach you that it's better to be humble. Yes. And so that's what they taught me. And so I did learn how to approach the show managers in a much more tactful and diplomatic way so that I could compete in their open classes and not be thrown off the grounds. So <laughs> that, that worked pretty well. It did. And in doing so, it brought a whole new breed of mare to mind to me because I was watching the dressage and combined training world and watching these amazing warm blood doing amazing things. And the action in these warm bloods was so superior than the normal breeds of horses that I wondered what it would be like to breed the jack to one of those kinds of horses. And then I found out that the people that bred those kinds of horses had a very tight registry that usually, well, they did, they originated in Europe. And so I was looking at Dutch warm bloods and I was looking at Tricaners and I was looking at Hanoverians and Frisians and all these people only to meet up with more resistance from the registries of these horses saying that they would not sell one of these horses to me so I could breed and corrupt their breed. <laughs> so that was a whole nother ball of wax that I had to fight with. Uh, yeah. It was really interesting. So I kind of went around the back fence. And by that time, the Tricaners were building up Tricaner farms in the West. And I thought, okay, I think I'm going to look around these farms and see if I can get one from America because I sure as heck am not going to be able to import one from Europe. They won't let me have one. So I looked around to try to find them and I looked at a lot of tricaners and they really did have the high action and I think they're more Arabian like mm -hmm. than they are like other breeds of horses yeah. that uh, tend to be more calm. Like the Dutch warm bloods are calmer, the Hanoverians were calmer. You know, the, the Tricaners were right up there with the Arabians and the Thoroughbreds in their reputation for being hotheads. And <laughs> I guess I I have a magnetism with hotheads. There you go. You're a hothead magnet. Yeah. And, and even my Jack was a hothead. So, I mean, but, but he didn't have a bad disposition, you know. And he wasn't mean. Nothing they did was mean. It was just trying too hard the way I looked at it. You know, these are athletes that are not being tested to their maximum ability. Mm. And it's kind of like the intelligent kid that gets bored with school. Oh, yeah. You know, <laughs> you have to challenge them. And so I was looking around and I found a Tricator mare that was personally owned. I couldn't get one from the farm. They wouldn't give it to me, not to breed to a jack. But I did find somebody that had bought one from the farm and papers and everything. She was beautiful. Her name was Venus. And I bred her to Little Jack Corner and I got three 
outstanding trichator mules out of her. They had all the action I would ever want. In the beginning, it was very, very difficult because, like I said, they were high ed. I gave the first one, Vicky, the Molly, to a gal that was from England that worked for me, and she took her after she was weaned. And then I kept Vinny for myself and sold the other male. Vinny was afraid of his own shadow. <laughs> and it took, it took him until he was 10 years old to settle down and stop spooking at everything that moved. And I thought, well, this is going to be really hard for dressage. It's already really hard just to get him going under saddle. We were still in the round pen at 10 years old. <laughs> and he couldn't get pardon? past the third grade. No, but no. <laughs> it and, took him and, time. And, and I thought, well, you know, if he's all afraid of all this stuff, then maybe I should be too. <laughs> and maybe I shouldn't get on him so quickly because he's just slow developing. He'll probably live a long time. So I got plenty of time. I did get him so I could ride him in the round pen. But when I got him to where he should probably graduate to the open arena, in the round pen when we first started, he actually, it, my round pen is five feet high. And here he is trotting, walk, track, canter around the round pen and everything. Decided he was bored with it and just jumped the fence <laughs> and went out. So All right. I, I thought, well, he's letting me ride him and he's doing pretty good. But if he, he bolts again and jumps the fence in the open arena, yeah. he may lose me on the way out because he was just, I mean, he was amazing. He could jump like a, a rabbit, a big rabbit. And so I wasn't all that skilled in jumping at that time. And I, I really didn't know if I was going to be able to ride him over a fence like that anyway. And I didn't know if I really wanted to, <laughs> you know. Besides which, I had, gosh, how many? I think I had like 20 mules anyway that were all in training. Mm. And so I thought, well, Vinny and I will just enjoy our time in the round pen together. And uh, <laughs> I have no death wish, so I'm not going <laughs> to take him out in the arena. And Vinny is now 33 years old, and he doesn't spook at anything anymore. And we can ride in the round pen, but we don't go out on the trail. <laughs> And we don't go in the arena. Okay. We just enjoy each other's company <laughs> as it is, you know. And I've learned with a lot of my rescues that sometimes it's best just to do that. Right. You know, I got a mini mill that's a total spaz. And she she will stand for me without the halter on and let me groom her and everything else. But you put her in the ground driving equipment, she'll go right through it. She won't have anything to do with it. Yeah. So she kind of taught me, you know, well, if you're going to rescue me, then do it. <laughs> you know, don't don't torture me. You know, so I'm like, okay, well, we're not into torture here. We're into having a good time. So that's what we do. And Vinny is just beautiful when I get to lunge him and watch his action. You know, and had I been younger when I got him, I could have maybe put the time in on him and done the dressage that I did with my thoroughbred quarter meal sundowner that made it to fourth level. I would love to have, have taken Vinny to that level because I think that he could have done it, but I didn't have the time. I was getting too older to do that. Mm -hmm. And like I said, I didn't have a death wish. Yeah. So anyway, when you're looking to breed your mule, why did I do a trichaner cross? I spent years breeding donkeys before I finally got little Jack Horner. And a sire that predictably threw refined, attractive, and athletic offspring. And some of the top halter mules in the country. And crossing him on the warm blood stock seemed like the natural thing to do next. But when I, I bred him with the Tricaner horse because it was a versatile horse with a durable animal. It was also a durable animal with refinement and elegance. Really? And... Oh, absolutely. Wow. And the combination of Little Jack Horner and this Tricaner, like I said, produced outstanding mule offspring with a just oozing athletic ability. Wow. So that would be, you know, if I was going to do it again and I was younger, I would go back to the Tricaner and use them. Hmm. If I wanted something that was a little less hot, might go with one of the Dutch warm bloods or Hanoverians or some of the other warm bloods that they have that are really just kind of nice, you know? So when you pick the mare that you want to use, think about what you want to do with the mule offspring. 
Do you want to do Jim Connor? Do you want to do English Western Pleasure? Or do you want something with a little bit more athletic ability, but some real versatility? That still can fall right into the quarter horses, the apps, the, the paints, Morgans. If you are concerned more with smooth trail riding, then you might want something like a Tennessee Walker or a Fox Trotter. And when we bred those, people told me, oh, they're not any good in the mountains and they're terrible for jumping and everything. And so what I did was I had a couple of Tennessee walking mules and got one that I was training and I took her on a on one of those dog hunts where they were going after, well, it wasn't even a real fox. It wasn't fox hunting. It was just hunting with hounds. Wow. You know, and and that little mule, she had longer pasterns and everything like those walking animals do. We were going up and down hills and stuff in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains, and she did fine, and she was even a pretty good jumper. So I wouldn't say that the walking mules are limited to flatland. Not really. Okay. They're just a really smooth, steady ride, but you still want one. They carry their heads higher, and that's okay as long as they can still carry the head higher and stretch their spine from head to tail. That's the important thing. Okay. And I might add at this point, when I'm training them, I use the elbow pull on them too. And a lot of people think that elbow pull is like draw reins, but it's not. Right. It, it, it just doesn't let them invert their necks and their backs. It causes them to stretch that spine mm -hmm. and carry the rider on an, on an upward arc. And it puts them in good posture for whatever breed they are, you know, and the different breeds carry their heads at different levels. And these, you know, saddlebreds, Tennessee Walkers, Fox Trotters all carry their heads a lot higher. The Morgans carry their heads higher than the Quarter Horses mm -hmm. do. But that elbow pull will let them carry those heads wherever their best posture is and teach them how to move their bodies properly. So that's what you kind of want to think about when you're picking a mare for breeding, think about what you want to do with her and set it up so, you know, and, and assess the jack too for good confirmation, good disposition, good temperament, good action in everything, good confirmation across the board. And when you breed those two things together, you get exceptional performance. When you go ahead and breed, you got to decide how you want to breed. If you want to breed your mare, I don't suggest having him bring the jack to your house. Um, you're going to have to take... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that could be a disaster. You know, you got to consider the, the facilities and everything, and Jacks require special facilities. Yeah, and he'll um, never want to go home. <laughs> no, probably not, and he'll probably break out and tear down the entire facility. Yeah. Uh, they're strong, they, and, and even one, one or two hot wires doesn't really discourage them at all. So, But when you're looking to breed your mare, take a look at the facility where the Jack is. Take a look at the Jack. But take a look at the facility because your mare is going to have to be there. And she's going to be there for a minimum of a week. Now, I have found that the best time to breed the mare is on the third and fifth day of her heat cycle. Mm. So if I was going to take a mare to a breeding facility, I would take her on the first day of heat and then tell the guys, I think it's probably best to breed her on day three and five. Because in my breeding experiences, that's when my mares settled. Okay. Actually, my mother had an exceptional breeding facility, and my mare, that I, my half Arab, half quarter mare that I had, I didn't have a place to keep her for the six years that I was working at my mom's ranch. So I told her for the board for the horse, she could go ahead and breed her and take the offspring. <laughs> that was a joke. <laughs> oh boy. My mare was a hothead, man, and she was very <laughs> attached to me. And the breeder there tried to AI her, and in six years, they never got her settled. Oh. But I brought her to Colorado, and right from the first breeding, she bred with, I bred her with Little Jack Warner in 1983 when he was finally old enough to breed at three years old. He gave me five babies with her in oh, a row. Okay. And they were amazing Arabian babies with Arabian type heads and all that athletic ability. It was just incredible. And so she was a happy horse here. You know, 15 to 18 days after breeding, your mare can be checked for pregnancy by ultrasound. Okay. The vet must do this. 
He'll palpate the mare through the rectum with an ultrasound device that will pick up the fetus if it's present. So that's how you can check. So you, when you take your mare for breeding, she can stay there until your vet can do this. It's the most accurate of pregnancy tests, and you can actually see the heartbeat on the monitor. Oh. These machines can all, yeah, it's pretty amazing. So, but at that point, when you're able to ultrasound, are you able to detect if there are indeed twins? Yeah, there'll be two heartbeats. Okay, so you're able to detect that at that time. Okay, which we Mm -hmm. know is not desirable, but... Well, we let the twins go. Really? Yeah, because it has a lot to do with management and feeding. Okay. And there's a lot of bad management and feeding out there. If you're feeding too much of something, that can affect the babies and the size of the babies. And one can get more and one can get less and one gets weak and one does not. Mm. That's a whole different ball of wax right there. But And it has a lot of to do with my experience with these animals and not necessarily with research tests in a lab. My vet said he recommended pinching one of the twins because he didn't think the other smaller one would necessarily survive if they were both left in there. Uh, But I said, "Let's, let's try it. Let's just try it. But these machines can also produce a Polaroid picture of the fetus. Okay. This is your ultrasound machine. Like I said, it's, it's wised ultrasound at 15 days. And then again, in two to three months, if the test is positive, to make sure that the mare does not abort or resorb the fetus. Palpation determines the exact time in the estrus cycle and can be used to check for pregnancy, like I said. The vet will reach into the rectum and feel the surrounding body organs with his hands and his, his hand and fingers. At 30 days from the day of conception, the fetus is about the size of a baseball. And the vet can detect the pregnancy and tell you on which side it's located. Hmm. This is the most common way to check for pregnancy, and it's not as costly as ultrasound. Managing your expectant mares. Pregnant mares should be kept in areas with adequate room for exercise, preferably with grass for grazing. Free choice hay can be a reasonable substitute. They should have plenty of fresh, clean water and trace mineral salt. Pregnant mares should not be fed alfalfa hay. I don't feed any of my equines alfalfa hay. It's just too rich and can cause all kinds of problems. It's advisable to, although this is counterintuitive, to take them off their oats mix six weeks before foaling and leave it until six weeks afterwards and keep them on grass hay only and pasture because the oats can cause severe colic in a pregnant mare. Mm. For safety, pregnant mares should be stabled with animals they get along with or by themselves. And certain shots should be altered to accommodate pregnant mares. And you need to ask your vet about what shots those are because the normal shots could interfere with pregnancy. When the mare is close to foaling time, give her a space of her own. If she's expected to build antibodies against the foal, she should be kept in a stall and monitored constantly because you will have to catch the foal at birth to avoid a potential catastrophe. This is neonatal isoerythrolysis, which we covered in another interview, which you can get all the details from about that there. I'm not going to go into that here. If she's at risk, she can be put in a pen or pasture provided the ground and fencing. Do- if she's not at risk, she can be put in a pen or pasture provided the ground and fencing do not present a hazard to the foal. Check the mare at least three times a day and have her tested. I would test out 60 days from foaling and then be sure to test again at 30 days from foaling for NI. The pregnant mares often will require extra vitamins and minerals, but you got to ask your vet about that. And it may be he can just give her some kind of an injection that will, will help her if she needs it. She may not. If you manage your mares really well and consistently then you shouldn't have a problem with that. So in preparation for the mule foal, the foal will need a safe place to be born. This is why it's important. Your pregnant mares need to be stabled where she will have a larger stall, plenty of room so she doesn't get cast in the stall. She can be kept on pasture and brought to her stall at night. So they generally like to foal at night. So if you do have a positive test for NI, then you do need to catch that foal. Mm, right. Fences should be foal safe. Beware of fences made from wire and barbed wire 
are not safe at all. Check the fences to make sure it's not possible for the foal to wriggle under it. A lot of foals have been born and wriggled under the fence, and then we're not able to get that colostrum in the first two hours. So these things are really important. Line the stall where the mare will be with a good, clean bedding of shavings or preferably straw, and make sure it's deep. Don't chintz on it on the bedding. It will be very wet at birth, and it needs to be able to absorb all that all that fluid. Try not to disturb the pair after the foal's born when you're cleaning the stall. Be ready for any problems that crop up. You gotta make sure the foal is able to break through the placenta at birth. If not, you'll need to assist. So keep a knife on hand for help, but use it carefully. Mm-hmm. If you have to assist with the birth, you can grab the front legs above the knees and pull in conjunction with the contractions. Do not pull against contraction. Keep a dry bath towel or two around to assist the mare in drying the foal should the weather be cold. Use plastic gloves to prevent spreading disease. If your mare has tested positive for neonatal isoerythrolysis, or NI, have a muzzle on hand to put on the foal at birth. Check your foal all over at birth. Look for abnormalities such as contracted tendons, hernias, insufficient respiration, irregular heartbeat, or listlessness. Let the umbilical cord break on its own accord. Soak the umbilical cord in betadine solutions prevent infection. The foal should be up and nursing the mare within an hour. So if he's having problems getting up, you can help him. After he's nursed, it's advisable to give him a fleet enema that's a disposable enema to help with activating the digestive tract. We were talking about after the foal has nursed to give him an enema with a fleet enema. They're, they're really easy to use and they just help everything get started. Okay. Because um, sometimes, sometimes the meconium can get stuck up in there. And so rather than wait until he's constipated for a long time, I just give them the fleet enema as a matter of course. Mm. And then you got you got to make sure that the mare passes the placenta and you got to make sure that it's all there. Check the whole thing and make sure there's no tears in it or pieces that have been retained. Then call the vet and make an appointment to have your foal completely checked over. Okay. Many foals are, are deficient in some minerals and vitamins at birth, particularly selenium, and that will affect their growth. The vet will be able to detect this and give you the right supplement. Keep the mare and foal confined in the stall for about three days after birth. This gives them time to bond before they're subjected to other distractions, and it allows the foal to gain some strength and growth before dealing with the new world into which he has been born. It's important to have your foaling supplies on hand and ready for the birth so that you're not running around once it happens. Make sure you have clean straw or shavings, a bucket with warm water, liquid soap, a roll of cotton wool, not sheet cotton, a tail wrap. You'll wrap the tail and wash the mare's vulva after the water breaks. Clean the cotton string to tie off the umbilical cord in case of hemorrhage, about 12 inches. Have it in your pocket so you can find it easily. Empty the bucket for the placenta. You need bath towels, betadine solution, the fleet enema, a foal muzzle for NI foals, stall cleaning tools because after the birth you want to clean it up. You make it nice and get all that moisture up, you know, before you leave them. Don't just leave it that way and pick up the placenta. Just get the stall cleaned again so that the foal has a nice, clean place to lay down. Have stall cleaning tools ready for you right there at the stall. A phone number for your vet for emergencies. The phone number of the vet just to call him and make the appointment, preferably for the next day. Blankets for the mare and foal in in cold climates. Plastic disposable gloves. Halter and lead for the mare. A flashlight. These are very handy when it's dark at night and the lights go out, because they can. (laughs) Uh, A stopwatch and a notepad for keeping the time that your mare spends in labor. Oh. And the truck and trailer ready to go in case of an emergency. I think there are signs that the foal is near. Normally, within three weeks of foaling, there's a dropping of the belly and the udder begins to form. As the foal time nears, the udder grows larger. The udder becomes rounder and stretches tight in appearance. This is called bagging up. The more foals the mare has produced, the more prominent her signs. 
few days before folding, there's a slackening of the sacro-pelvic ligaments, causing a sinking on either side of the dock of the tail, a dropping of the croup, and hollowing in the flanks. Usually, within 48 hours of folding, the teat orifices will become plugged and cocked with wax and caked with wax. Within 24 hours, milk will begin to drip from the teats. The lips of the vulva will become swollen and moist within 12 hours of folding. The mucous membrane of the vagina turns a deep red in color. This is the most consistent sign and does not vary. All of the other signs may or may not be present. Many times mares show no signs and the owner wakes up to find a new foal on the ground. Mm. They love to do it when you're not looking. <laughs> okay. we, we had a camera in our folding stalls with the monitor in the house and still missed a couple of eye folds. These mares are pretty, pretty tricky. Yeah. The forces involved in folding are the muscles of the uterus and the belly or abdominal muscles. These muscles push the foal through the pelvic girdle. The foal is squeezed out and the fluid content in the amnion and the elantrochorion facilitates this process. In the first stage of labor, the mare will exhibit pain, uneasiness, walking around, pawing the ground, intermittent eating, profuse or patchy sweating, retraction of the upper lip, and milk squirting from both teats of the udder. Between these signs, there will be periods of normality. The duration of the signs will also vary from a short time to several hours. The first stage can often be missed, especially in older mares. Occasionally, a mare will begin the first stage of labor some days before actual parturation. The second stage labor, one may observe prolonged time lying down. Often mares will lie with their backs against a wall or a fence, they appear to be straightening their backs for the laurelantic toic membrane and ends when the foal is delivered. This should take 20 minutes. Taking any longer is abnormal. The mare will get up and down, changing from side to side, and sometimes will strain when standing. Between straining, she may actually nibble grass straw or anything that happens to be around. Often, she will sniff the fluid and curl her upper lips. She may roll from side to side to help position the foal. Foals will have small stomach and will nurse at frequent intervals. The foal will also be observed taking small nibbles of the mare's dung, which serves the purpose of populating the microflora in a large bowel, aiding in the digestion of solid food. Keeping the foal with his dam in a small area, such as a stall for the first 36 to 48 hours, allows the foal and mare to bond, but also gives you the time to assess that the birth was normal and that the mare and foal are both fine. Now, sometimes the mares will reject the foal, in which case you may need to bottle feed. It's best to go ahead and try to get the foal to be able to nurse the same way you would if you've got an anti foal. Just tie up the mare and then bring the foal up to her flanks and try to push his face down there to the udder. And if she stamps and offers to kick and won't let him do it, then you're probably going to have to bottle feed this yeah. foal. Wow. So, so now with mule foals, they're smaller than horse foals are and calves. And so the, the bottles that they have for feeding calves and horse foals often has a nipple on it that's actually too big for a mule foal. Okay. What I used was human baby bottles, and then I enlarged the hole in the nipple, but I made sure that the hole wasn't too large because you don't want that milk to come screaming in there and choke them. So I did it, what, about an eighth of an inch hole in the end of that thing. The foal, if he's eating well, can finish two to four eight-ounce bottles in one feeding, depending on his size and his appetite. Orphan foals should get colostrum within the first 12 hours in order for it to be absorbed into his system. So that should be the first milk that you feed him. If the mare is rejecting him, then that's the first stuff you got to get. And you got to prep for that. Even if you don't have an NI foal, uh, if there's a chance, you know, if you've got a first time baby or whatever, the mare may very well reject him. You got to be ready in case she does, and colostrum is gold. So you go ahead and try to get your vet to get you some and then store it. Or if you have an outlet that you know of, go ahead and get it and keep it on hand. Full supplement milk can be purchased at local feed stores. But I found that goat's milk was the best. They really like that, and it's high in the, all the nutrients that they need. you got to be sure to hold the bottle high enough so the foal is in the same position he would be in if he was nursing his dam. 
Be patient and make these times pleasant for you and the full, since this is an excellent time for bonding. Keep, like I said, a notebook on hand and take good notes and keep good birth records and ongoing records. They have things that you can print out on your computer, but I found that all this stuff they had print out on your computer just gets to be a whole lot of paper. So what I did was I just got those paper folders that have pockets in them and then they they will hold paper when you punch the holes in them and everything and i got clear plastic sheet covers and put those in there so all the paper that i put into the folder i put in a sheet protector that includes getting five by seven cards and up at the top i wrote the animal's name on it and the date they were full and that's how i keep their ongoing records for their vaccinations for their farrier visits, their shot, for any kind of work that's been done on them every time anything's happened to them. I just write the date and then right beside it what it was. And I've got a whole stack of those cards. So when you run out of room on the front and back of one card, then you just get another one, stick it in the sheet protector with the other cards and just keep them there. And just have all of your ongoing health records on those five by seven cards because then you don't have to go, oh, well, where's the worming form? Oh, where's the farrier form? You know, (laughs) you got it all on one five by seven card and you just start stacking up those cards inside those clear sheet protectors in a folder with the animal's name on it and their registration papers and anything else concerning that animal. That's an easy way to keep records. And believe me, when I started that, when I had 32 animals, I only have 17 now, but it's so much easier. And then when the vet's there right after he leaves, I just enter what I have to enter on those cards. And so it's always up to date and it never takes very long to do. If the vet needs to see the history the health records history, then you got it right there. It's all in one one folder. And you can just pull it out and give it to him. You know, let him read what he wants to read. Castration of mule foals is often a question. And with these male mule foals, all mule foals that are males need to be castrated. They can be as dangerous if left a stallion just like the jacks. They're half jack, remember. They do need to be castrated. But the question is when. A lot of people let it go too long and they wean too early. So what I did was I found that mule foals need to be castrated at about five months if I'm going to wean at six months because castration is a a very traumatic surgery yeah and so you know you don't want them getting all upset and having to be by themselves as they're draining and everything because they'll get depressed and they won't move around Mm -hmm. and that scission needs to stay open you don't stitch it shut mule foals need to be castrated not only with ligation but also by actually cauterizing the internal things so they don't grow back because a lot of them have have grown back you know it's just that hyper endurance and toughness and fear that the mule has you know they do things that we don't expect so it's best to have them both cauterized and tied and then leave it open to drain and if they're with their mom if you don't wean until six months then they have they develop a good confident secure attitude and they don't get depressed and they don't get resentful or anything like that and they will walk around with their mom and that thing will drain a whole lot better and so you have less chance of infection after castration if you do it this way And then that's all healed and everything, and he's starting to eat the food and eating the oats mix and all of that with his mom. At six months or maybe even seven months, then you can wean him, and he will have forgotten about all the castration trauma. It's also important when you wean him that they have a buddy to be weaned with. Don't just take him off somewhere else and keep him by himself. Mm. Isolation has a horrible effect on them the same way it does on us. We don't like being isolated from our friends. And when you take us away from our family and we we have to become independent on our own, even that's kind of traumatic. Yeah. So we want to keep this as little trauma as possible. And foals that are weaned early, a lot of people see them eating at three months, so they think, oh, well, I can wean them now, you know. But they can also suffer a nutritional deficit and may not grow to their full potential physically. 
it's best to wean a foal at six months. Foals being weaned, like I said, should be kept in a safe enclosure with fresh water, a daily ration of, of their oats mix, and free choice grass hay. They should not be kept completely alone. If you don't have anybody that you can put in with the foal, then have somebody in a pen right next to them so they have a buddy so they don't get lonely. The buddy can be in the same pen, like I said, or in an adjacent pen. The buddy can actually be a gelding horse or another mule foal or even a donkey. Although donkeys, it would have to be a single donkey because otherwise the donkey would go with the family. Right, donkeys yeah. don't, don't mix that well with other species. Keep that in mind, too. During early leading training, the foal will do better if he has a friend along to help him feel confident and secure. So you just take his friend along for his, his leading lessons and tie the friend along the fence, and he can learn to be independent later as he gains confidence, just the same way that humans do. We all need kind of a buddy to support us and to urge us on to do the right thing, and, and that's what the buddy does during their, their early leading lessons. And then you don't end up fighting with the foal over all these things and having to put ropes on their butt to make them go forward and everything. So usually do pretty well. If they start to pull against you, you just take them over to the fence and tie them alongside their buddy and then just do little tugs on the rope. And if they step towards you and loosen that top rope and give you some slack, then you can untie them from the fence and try to lead them. If they don't want to go away from their buddy, then just walk around their buddy. Just walk around from one side around the back to the other side, then call it a lesson. There it all go. doesn't have to happen all at once, yeah. in other words. You establish a relationship that feeds them confidence, knowing that your actions are predictable and you're not going to force them to do anything that they don't want to do right now. Mm -hmm. You know, that, right. that can be saved for another time. The vet can estimate weight if you're really into that much weight thing. I pretty much eyeball my animals. A lot of people, ah, how much does he weigh and everything? And I go, well, I don't know, but he looks good. <laughs> you know, if he's, <laughs> if he's got a quarter inch of fat over his body, then I'd say he's doing pretty good. Oh, well, yeah. You know, <laughs> and and if they get a little bit more than that quarter inch, if they get up, up to three quarters and they start showing those fat ripples, then time to back off. You know, but usually the foals can have free choice grass hay and it does not do that to them. There it does go. not make them obese. You measure your foal's height with an equine measuring stick to determine the number of hands, four inches to hand. Measure from the top of the withers straight down to the ground. He should be within two inches of the height of his dam when he has matured. By measuring his height every six months or so, you can tell if he's growing properly. But you cannot accurately predict what he's going to be at full maturity. There's a lot of things, oh, if the cannon bone is this long, then he's going to be this or that. And, you know, they're, like I said before, they're all individuals. And if they're fed properly and cared for properly and they're healthy, you'll get most of the time 50% the mare's height, 25% two inches taller than the mare and 25% two inches shorter than the mare just by genetics. And so that's kind of the best you can do. Preventing disease starts from the moment the foal is conceived. Equines usually get sick because of poor management. Management involves paying attention to details and watching for early signs of problems so you can correct them right away. Take proper care of the expectant mother. It's just as important as taking care of the foal. Good management means proper feeding and plenty of fresh, clean water, providing well-ventilated housing and enough room for daily turnout. Take care not to overcrowd your meals. Crowding causes stress, and stress decreases their resistance to disease. Showing is also stressful and brings your meal into contact with other animals that may not be healthy, even with their health papers and Coggins tests. Show animals require more stringent routine care programs that include regular vaccinations and warmings. I have been known to take the foals to shows in the past, but I don't think that I would do that any longer unless they're two years old or older. It's just too risky for young foals. Yeah. 10 to 12 weeks after foaling, your mare will go through her foal heat cycle, and it's at this time that most foals develop diarrhea called scours in foals. It usually doesn't last much longer than a week to 10 days, and it can be treated with an antibacterial paste. Your veterinarian can tell you where and what purchase. 
dummy foals. Dummy foal management can be a little distraught and stressful because these foals are often born rapidly and they are apparently normal. The delivery is quick with no problems. The foal may attempt to suck normally, walk and follow the mare. The onset of signs of a problem is abrupt. The foal will completely lose his sucking reflex and will show jerky head and body movements. He may grind his teeth and make strange barking sounds. He will wander aimlessly. Most affected foals will eventually go down and paddle and become convulsive. Call your vet if you think you have a dummy foal. He will need fluid and drug therapy. It's often advisable to keep him in a warm house instead of the barn for easier management. He may recover in a few days or a few weeks. Recovery is usually complete. Another therapy I know that they have for dummy foals that has worked pretty successfully is wrapping them in a tight blanket and massaging them periodically, quite often, actually, and this often will bring them out of it. Okay. Also, we are confronted with how desperate is it to have an ID number or a brand. I started out by tattooing the upper lips of my uh, offspring, and that seemed to work okay until it faded three years later. That didn't really work. Not well, anyway. Branding, I just don't like the idea of branding at all. That's burning skin. Okay. And at some level, it has to be traumatic to the animal. I think they're big, they're tough, they're this, they're that. But I have had several encounters with my animals. They've let me know that painful uh, experiences that they have, that they do remember and it affects their behavior later and sometimes all through their lives. So what, uh, what about freeze branding? It's the same thing. It's okay. branding. It's damaging the skin. Okay. I mean, how can that not be painful? You know, it, we think that they don't feel these things as humans. We Oh, yeah, it's only for a minute, blah, blah, blah. My animals have let me know that it may only be for a minute, but they don't forget. Right. And that's yeah. wherein lies the problem. They might decide to remember it at the wrong time. (laughs) (laughs) There you go. Gotcha. (laughs) It's better just to keep your interactions with them kind and non-abusive and thoughtful and comfortable because that builds their confidence and trust in you. I do not condone putting chips in anything. I think that's a fad that came along with big tech. You can't fathom it. You put something inside the body like that, yeah. and it can travel. And who, what, who knows what it's doing inside the body if it starts to travel. Yeah. You know, it's just not one of those things that I say is safe. Besides which, I have learned that when you do this much management with your equines, and you get to know them as well as you do from keeping them at the forefront of your mind as far as kind and considerate treatment, that you will come to know them as well as you know your human friends. And if somebody steals your animal, if, they, if you can run them down, you are going to know that that's your animal. And you don't have to prove it to anybody other than stand there and call them and have them come to you like the dog does. Huh, sure. It's people that demand that you prove this and prove that. Yeah. But when you have consideration for your equines the way that I do mine, first of all, it's going to be really hard for people to even steal your animal because if they do and they take it to their place, they'll probably escape and come back home. <laughs> I, I, yeah. I have Pro- that they liked you. The, yeah. downer, you know, I thought, oh, well, I'm, uh, it's not too far away here is this reigning trainer, and I'd like Sonny to do the reigning out at Bishop, but I don't know how to train him. So I'm going to have Steve do it. And Steve Schwarzenberger trained Sonny for reigning. While he was down at the stable, he escaped. <laughs> <laughs> and it was about a mile from here, I guess. And all of a sudden, I'm walking out the door, the front door of the house, and here comes Sonny. (laughs) And then a little while, just a little while later, here comes Steve in his truck. (laughs) And he goes, he wanted to go home. (laughs) And he jerked that leave rope right out of my hand, walked right through the door, just smashed it open, went through it, and ran home. So... You know, if your animals love you that much, they're going to find a way to get back to you. They have a homing instinct in them, too. 
that I don't think people often have an encounter with it. But I have. My animals don't even leave the place when they get out of their pens. They stay here and they invite the neighbors. Oh, yeah. I have, <laughs> I have a, a guy that has a pasture that he uses for boarding, you know, people's animals over there and horses. Not so many mules, although there was a mule over there once. I walked out one day and my mules had gotten the gate open and they invited 15 horses into the pasture. And they had a block party. It's like mom and dad yeah, that, left, did. that left for the weekend. I had to sort my own mules out of the herd of horses, <laughs> keep the herd of the horses right there at the pasture on the road, alongside the road, uh, so that the people that own the horses could come by and get them and take them back to where they were boarded. <laughs> what a hoot. These, these mules are incredible. They, they just truly are, and the, and the things they do never cease to amaze me. And you were saying at the beginning of the interview how much we are covering and how many different things there yeah. are to talk about. Well, that's absolutely true because they haven't stopped doing them yet, and <laughs> and we've been doing this, you know, this stuff together for fifty years, right. and they're always coming up with something new. So they're always going to give us something to talk about, <laughs> you know, and it. <laughs> I don't think we'll ever run out of subjects. No, no. Because they won't let us. That's right. Oh, my gosh. All right. Well, Meredith, thank you for coming on. And, of course, they can get this information uh, on your website. And if you go to the store on my website, I sell a book called A Guide to Raising and Showing Mules. And it has all this information on the management and care of Jack's mule, mule foals, bears, and everything in it that is not training. All about disease, all about the things that you can run into in you know, the course of the management of your equines. If you'd like to be a guest on the show or a sponsor, send me an email. Every cowgirl's dream at gmail.com. Gotta go. My mule is looking for me. Meal Talk is an Every Cowgirl's Dream production.